Welcome back. It's Richie here with you. Thanks again to John Brown for uh, taking time out to speak to us tonight. Earlier on this evening, Shamrock Rovers beaten 3 0 in Razgrad to Ludogorets, the Bulgarian champions of the last 11 years, uh, putting two goals past Rovers in the first half, both of those from Piero Sertiriu, and the third coming in added time through Igor Tiago. Uh, the substitute uh, laid on for the hosts. So, what had looked like a, I guess a workable task for Shamrock Rovers in the second half looks like becoming a very 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 difficult one back at Tallis Stadium Vinnie Perth the ex Dundalk boss had eyes on this one Vinny, welcome back to the show yeah how are you doing Richie keeping good not too bad thanks not too bad despite your uh, your blaspheming off the air uh, about my yeah. appearance on here. That, that's fine that's fine don't worry about that we won't let it we won't let it come between us Vinny um, no. the game tonight like I was trying to keep eyes on it as best I can while presenting the show uh, live for the full three hours. It seemed to be Rovers were kind of under the cosh for the first half hour, 40 minutes, uh, conceded twice within that spell. Started the second half, actually looked to gain more control and then really suffered that sucker punch uh, right at the end, which made things very, very difficult for them. I don't know if that's an accurate summation to, to what you saw. Yeah. No, it's very, very, very close to it. Um, obviously, in 90 minutes, you sum it up in 30 seconds, you wouldn't be far off it. Um, Rovers, you feared for them at half time. I felt they could be on the end of a, or of a sort of a serious beating, for want of a better word. Alan Manis has made two, three excellent, outstanding saves that you thought had kept the tie alive, but ultimately, um, late, late in injury time, the third goal is has most likely killed it up the toy off and um it's disappointing it's disappointing um really really rooting for Rovers tonight but it just felt you were outclassed uh, on the night um much much better in the second half and um inter- the subs subs made a big difference uh Graham Bork in particular mm. but ultimately um yeah just weren't weren't good enough and uh, unfortunately you know you need to be realistic as well we had one sort of half shot from Graham Bork which whether it was a cross or shot, I don't know. Keeper saved it comfortably. But beyond that, Rovers didn't trouble them from an attacking point of view. So you'd have, uh, you would have to say it's a really difficult uh, tie now and you would imagine it's gone from them. At times, they look really pinned back during the course of that first half. And I guess there's a lot of um, kind of... You just have to be somewhat conservative because you don't want that scoreline to become a cricket one during the course of the first 45 minutes. But it's not as if... Rovers in terms of numbers would have been swamped in midfield because they did have um, McCann in there they had Dylan Watts in there um, they had Richie Tell essentially playing as a withdrawn striker so you can count him as another body in midfield what led to them being overrun to such a degree well, in the first half Vinny? Um, well I suppose Rovers played a trade the back and sort of we call it a box midfield with this sort of four in, in the sort of central area mm. um, where they got overrun was probably um, Ludogratz were a quality side and they play under under pressure and, and had no real fears, weren't worried about so the Rovers having dominance in terms of the number of bodies in there. They still made passes. But ultimately, I think the lesson, if I, I, I've seen a lot of, of teams this year but it, and I've seen Rovers sometimes um, struggle, I think, in the wide areas in terms of their shape and while it works domestically um, in wide areas, they struggle tonight. I think um, the, the sort of first goal typifies that it's a switch from from the left hand side to the right hand side, sort of a two v one. The ball is set back, ball into the box, and it's a brilliant header and a one nil down. So, I think while they got extra bodies in that central area, they struggled in you struggled sometimes in that shape uh, against top class opposition, and I think uh, that sort of went against them tonight. Um, again, it's easy on the cheap seats to to see this stuff, but mm. I think they're vulnerable in the wide areas. And I think that higher level you go up, um, the more you get punished. Um, so I think if you look at the form this year, Richie, I, I've seen some games they've won. They haven't really bashed anybody. They've won by the odd goal here and there. And they don't look like that they're going to create loads of chances for the most dominant team in their league. And ultimately... Um, you know, they, they would have to question some of that, I think, as as they go on developing Europe throughout this year. When you look at the players that, that Stephen Bradley does have his, at his disposal, you would figure that they should, on a domestic level, be winning games more comfortably and might be able to be more proactive in terms of how they attack games because they do have the Rory Gaffneys and Richie Tells and Graham Burks of this yeah. world and um, you've got creative players in there in midfield too like Jack Byrne wasn't used really tonight but you know he can certainly create midfield and might be the option as opposed to McCann next week but 
you kind of wonder why there is that element of conservatism around Shamrock Rovers given the talents that he does have at his disposal there. Yeah, domestically, there's no doubt they've an outstanding uh, squad. Uh, from a European perspective, that that's different. Mm. It's different. And, uh, I learned that lesson. You, you you know, you go down into the top teams you play, wherever they, whoever they are, AZ Alkmaar, Ludacrets, their benches, and you've seen it tonight, Ludacrets' bench was, was, was really outstanding. Um, and that's the difference. But domestically, I would say to you, um, for me, for me, just as an observer, someone who's now watching games left, right and centre in the league, I would say uh, Shamrock Rovers are so good uh, dominating possession, but you would fear that they lack a little bit of pace at times um, and that will that could play out in Europe, I would say. So, um, neat and tidy, great, you know, lots of stuff. Rory Gaffney's been one of the best players in the league this season at times, but that running power in behind um, and they play with that system where their wing backs um, are, are full backs. So they, you know, when you go back to, uh, if you go back to even to Dundalk, which is easier for me to talk about, you think of Daryl mm. Horgan, you think of Sean Gannon overlapping, Dane Massey overlapping, and uh, they're two different ways of playing. It's a bit like comparing, say, Liverpool to Man City in terms of the style. Man City is all about wearing teams down by pass, 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 and you have to be really brilliant to do that. And they are in domestically. In Europe, I would wonder, I hope that's able to transfer onto the pitch and that would be a concern of mine. So I would say to you, they lack some pace at times uh, yeah. down the sides of teams and you've got to mix your game up. Looking and, looking at the, would, yeah, looking, looking at the wit element there, Vinny, sorry to cut across you, looking at the wit element there, they do have that, you know, wing back, wide player kind of situation, uh, certainly on the left with Andy Lyons. On the right, it's Ronan Finn. They're not exactly, a, you know, like for like in terms of what they bring to the game one is uh, one is certainly you know made his made his bones as, as a fullback at Daily Mount Ronan Finn you know midfielder winger on occasion kind of with strikers striker sometimes it, it, that lack of symmetry I guess has that been harmful to them in Europe? Um, well we're, going to, we're about to find out I think tonight um, we didn't get a lot from Ronan Finn uh, he's done a brilliant job uh, it's 50th game in Europe what a servant he has been to Irish football clubs in Europe. So we didn't get you didn't get a lot from tonight. Andy Lyons later in the game, a couple of decent runs, but it's such a difficult position to wing back. When you look at the modern game, you think you think that someone that springs to mind to play with the battery would be Chelsea. Mm. I mean you think of, of Rudiger on the right wing whipping crosses in, but you also think Aston Quetta breaking from um the third centre half, the right side centre half and making two V ones. So uh, you would say, look, that, that's just an observation of mine in terms of where they need to create a little bit more. And uh, and I, I keep saying the one thing I have learned in sort of the last eight nine years in, in European football is you've you've got to have pace. Uh, very few teams you meet in Europe are slow and sluggish. You to hurt them, you've got to have pace and pace in behind. And uh, Andy Lyons has had a good season domestically, but. It doesn't. It doesn't wash in Europe. This is a level above, and Andy Lyons will be tested as a wing back this year in Europe. And um, I'd, I'd say a lot of clubs are are watching some of these players, seeing can they make the next step up. And um, again, and Andy, for example, he, he more or less playing on the wrong side, so it, mm. it's a little bit more difficult. And he's done well in that position. Would you give them any hope in the second leg? Like like a two 0 While watching it, I was kind of figuring. Do you know what they've? They found a way into this game to a degree, and maybe there's a little bit of that was Ludogorets still in preseason and kind of slunk back into themselves a little bit. But at two 0 you kind of definitely felt that back at a full Tallis Stadium, this was a job that could be done. Three 0 yeah, is very different. We have seen a lot of teams in your not travel well in Europe. It's it's just part of we've seen it. I mean, we, we played against what I thought was a brilliant bat day team, and we. We hammered them three 0 in Tallaght for no reason. Just some teams don't travel well. Mm. The other thing that I took a little bit of heart from was it reminded me of the, the that Vitesse Arnhem side last year. The difference is Shamrock Rovers are 26, 27 games into a season, and late in the games, the Irish teams' fitness levels um, have, have taken over, and it's repeated itself again. But Rovers this year, this this toy got really strong as the game went on, and their fitness was much better, I would say, than Ludacris. 
So they've only played two league games, a couple of European games. So they're only four or five games into a season where it's it's mid-season for Rovers. So that's a huge advantage for the Irish clubs when you come up against these teams. It can be a le- level or late in the game. But with 3-0, I, I fear, I, I'd imagine Rovers could concede next week. I think their Lillipert's attack is that good. So if they concede, it means Rovers have to score four. And that's a huge challenge in, in Champions League football. So... Uh, I'm hoping against hope that it's a, it's a memorable night, but it's going to be a really difficult one for them. They haven't created anything tonight to give you hope so yeah. far. Uh, they've got a couple of, of parachutes uh, to put them mildly because they will drop down into the third qualifying round of the Europa League should they exit at this stage of the Champions League. And what will await them still is very much up in the air because uh, there's seven minutes to go in the uh, Croatian in Croatia tonight. Uh, Dino Zagreb won, Skupi, the uh, North Macedonian champions, won. Uh, but a hell of a result as well for Linfield in Belfast. Bodo Glimt, a side you may remember last year, uh, put six past Jose Mourinho's Roma in Europe. Bodo Glimt beaten by a goal to nil tonight by Linfield up at Windsor Park. A hell of a result for them. And all of our football on Off the Ball brought to you by Sky. Watch Premier League, Women's Super League, EFL, Scottish Premiership and much more live on Sky Sports. Um, while I have you, Vinny, I wanted to talk about this something of a, a drain that's been ongoing through the course of, of this season um, as regards talent and young talent from the League of Ireland over towards England in particular. We can't ignore Italy, obviously with Liam Kerrigan heading from UCD uh, over towards uh, Como um, and James Abanco obviously going from Pats to, to Udinese. But we see Andy Lyons, we've mentioned there, he looks like he's going to be heading for Blackpool in the Championship. Um, Owen Toll has attracted the interest of Bolton, uh, the Derry City defender. Um, Promise I'm a share we learned today as well. Looks like he's going to be heading for a, a five-figure sum to Fleetwood in League One in England. It's it's not just me. This does seem like things have kind of ramped up a notch in terms of players going mid-season over towards England. Danny Mandry obviously going to Lincoln in recent weeks. Dawson Devoy going to, to MK Dons. There's been a lot of them and a, a lot of really good players and a lot of key performers for a lot of the top teams are suddenly going and it feels like a drain this year. Um, it's a massive problem for our game. I think our game is struggling as a result of it. I don't think our league is overly competitive at the moment because of it with the quality we lost last year and that's seeping into this year. So when you look at some of the players like uh, Dara Barnes as well, leaving Pats, mm. when you look at some of the um, players that left, say, Drogheda last year, uh, Redmond went to Crystal Palace. Back in the day, he would have went to a, one of the top two or three teams, played there for a year or two before he went to England. So it's been a real drain, um, what we've lost to Georgie Kelly's. Um, um, we've just lost real talent over league. And I think the league is suffering as a result of it. Um, but there's no easy solution to it. Um, people will throw out, you know, clickbait and different bits and pieces. It's the FEI's fault. It's the club's fault. It's 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 a player's market at the moment. And you've only to look at Luke McNally going to Oxford. Mm. And he's now just gone from Oxford, uh, having a really good season. He's moved to Burnley in the Championship. And you would argue if he had a good season there, he's not far off an international place. Or Jamie McGrath going to St. Mirren and all of a sudden starting international football for on the way to Portugal, etc. So these players are chasing a dream. And uh, um, people will say, well, the clubs have to have long-term contracts in place. There isn't the finance in Ireland to have players on long-term contracts. And it's a, it's a player's market, um, a huge amount of agents involved in Irish football now. Um, and there's the silly sort of, uh, what would you say? What, what's the term I'm looking for? Exit clauses and yeah. buyout clauses buyout on clauses, people's yeah. contracts are quite low. But, but at the same time, if, for example, I'm representing a player tomorrow and I turn up at Bowles, if Bowles don't agree to that, I'll just take him up the road to Shelbourne or up the road to Dundalk. And it's very, very difficult for Irish clubs at the moment to compete. There English football, I go to a lot of games, as I said, and I sit in certain sections. There's been guys from Lincoln, Blackpool, Oxford, MK Dons. I've sat with them all. They're all here looking for a little bit of value. And um, it's very hard to stop players. And it's not an easy answer. And it's very easy to throw out people should do more. But it is a real concern for our game, I have to say, because uh, I think it's it's starting to play out in the pitch that um, how, the strength and depth is not there. How big is the is the um, agent influence here? Because a lot of people might be surprised. Like the, people hear agents, 
they might go as far back as, as Eric Hall champing on his cigar and trying to sell as many you know Wimbledon players as he possibly can or the modern day version will be like you know your Mina Riolas or, or, or George Mendes etc that's how they view agent but how prevalent is the role of an agent in League of Ireland football at the moment um, from from managing it's huge it's it's um, you might talk to a player about signing for your club um, you know I've sat with a player for two and three hours got to know him worked out what his family was like then got into the you know the finance of it oh you talk to the agent about that that's the modern game we live in now you speak about the best the biggest agent in the world um, would have would, would have clients in Ireland as well it's part of the game um, why would you have like why would you have a, a player because in Ireland, if you were one, if you were one of the, you know, Ronaldo's agent, etc., because it's 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 football is such a gamble at the moment that you, you you're rolling a dice. A player could be the next Ronaldo, Messi in four or five years' time, and kids 15, 16, 17, 18, all albeit not legally allowed, have an agent until I think 16. Open for correction on that. They have agents who represent them now, so it's. It's a modern part of the game. Uh, every League of Ireland manager at every level is dealing with agents, um, even part-time clubs from UCD being the exception in one sense, as in the scholarship there, but from from Finn Harps all the way up, there's agents involved contacting every manager, and it is now right front and centre part of the game. And the agent's job, you have to remember, is to is get the very best deal for the player. Yeah. So that might be, I'll take... I'll, I'll say I used on Doc when I was there, um, offered me a player really interested in him. Yeah, but unless there's a a, a buyout clause of fifty thousand, he's not going to sign for you. If you don't agree to that, I just take him somewhere else, and someone will agree to it. So it is it is a difficult one, and we're losing a lot of talent for small money, um, like Danny Mandro gone for for thirty thousand. Makes no sense to me. I don't know the ins and outs of the deal, but. Um, I had a similar situation where someone came in for a really important player belonged to Dundalk. Um, I rode with our with our ownership, uh, similar size fee. Insisted he didn't play, he didn't leave, and he was instrumental in us beating um, uh, the talent side last year, which made maybe four 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 hundred and fifty thousand pound for the club, and uh, almost. He scored two goals, so you work out who I'm talking about. Almost knocked out uh, Vitesse Arnhem. And by holding on to that player, uh, the investment in him and, and staying away from that money was well worth it. So it, it is judgment calls, and clubs have to be brave, particularly the clubs in Europe. If you're still in Europe, you can't let your players go for cheap. I'm wondering out loud here the exit clauses the, the the escape clauses we've seen in terms of like numbers they're all in around they seem near in around the five figures promise I'm a share from what I hear is five figures it's going to be add-ons the, Danny Mandry was 30 grand which became pretty public like it's a vicious cycle because that kind of money if a club comes in and offers the, the opportunity to the player it behooves the player to listen to the opportunity that's available to them but similarly the club are getting stung for like if Rovers progress in Europe like the thirty grand is like not doesn't compare to the money they could get if they progress in Europe. So you want to hang on to the player. You also want to pr- progress in Europe. But if you don't hang on to the player, you're not going to progress in Europe. So you're going to end up with a lesser sum of money. From an agent's point of view, I'm not going to point the finger here at anybody because that's dangerous territory legally. Um, is that a coincidence that the the numbers are so low compared to what they would get as regards European football oh. revenue? Like I certainly wouldn't be a spokesman for agents, but what I will say is it's the agent's job to do uh, the best deal you can for the player. So the, the smaller that um, release cause is, the better for the player. Um, but you do, so So in fairness, the agent has to do what's right by his client. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's just simple economics. And uh, football is, is, is governed by economics as much as anybody. It also allows an agent, um, also allow, allows an agent to lower the fee to increase his the sign on fee for the player for argument's sake or the agent's fee whatever the case may be there's nothing illegal in that there's nothing doing anything wrong it's 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 it as i said it is definitely a player's market at the moment mm. in irish football and if you're any way good and listen we, we all mentioned that the, the, the likes of the danny mandrew figure or or the promise figure seems to be quite low 
But there has been some brilliant deals done as well. I mean, the Dara Burns trigger, from what I hear, is is a really good figure with add-ons. Um, you look at um, so, some of the some of the money, say Pats have, have earned recently. They've done really good business there. Jared Bryan, in particular, sounds a lot of credit. So there, there is good that comes out of it. The problem is we haven't got the talent pool uh, to keep losing these players, and you're starting to see now an influx of players coming from um, outside of Ireland into Ireland. So maybe Bill Hulsoys, I know what he was doing all along. I don't know. That that thing of like, because I remember listening to to Keith Long recently, um, um, talking about the markets because. He he said that there's more value to be had because you're bringing in players from outside of the league, and because obviously it's a it's a summer league, there's better you know a deeper talent pool in which to fish in the summer than there would be in the winter. Naturally speaking, would it behoove the FAI to consider just from a pure player development and finances of a club aspect to consider a switch back to the winter football model, or are we married to this now? As a no, we have to be married to it. We, we will not progress in Europe unless, and Europe is the key for everything for Irish football to build. And if we go back to winter football, we're taking a step back into the into the dark ages. Our facilities aren't good enough, our pitches aren't good enough, uh, they're barely good enough for summer football, mm-hmm. and we just can't do it. But uh, Keith's point is well made. Like, I could sign a Latvian international uh, last, or Dundalk, where I have to sign a Latvian international. Um, for a hell of a lot less money than an Irish-based player. Um, there is value in the market it, with, around Europe. We're starting to see that, as I said. There's a lot of teams now picking up players from. And you do. It, the problem is you do make mistakes with them because it's a different. You, don't, you can't do the same amount of homework as you can do with an Irish player. But we're going to have to dip, dip into that market uh, because like, our results in Europe... Are struggling at the moment. I would say it's a big test for Rovers. I do believe there's a group stages in the team this year, um, because of the way it's set up. You've only to win one tie, and they're in the conference minimum. Um, but but Derry had a difficult time. You would imagine Sligo just about got through, but that's a difficult tie for them. And, and Pat's go again on Thursday, so we probably need a hand, and we need players to come from outside of Ireland now to really help the league because. We're, we're at we're at we've done a lot of work the, the crowds are brilliant the clubs have really worked hard the FEI to be fair have put good structures in place to help us to a point and um, but what we can't do now is 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 the product start to drop and deteriorate and you, unless you're involved with a European club you can't explain that the the sort of whole public and not just the football public but everyone has a huge interest in it it, it really captures the imagination of of the Irish public walking down streets, and it is so. It is such an important to grow a game here that we improve in Europe. I think we need a hand from from outside of Irish base pool. Vinny, it's a pleasure as always, even if the the, the tone is somewhat pessimistic this evening in terms of progress well, look, in Europe. And will be, I, I, I'm going to say I think Rovers will make a group stages this year. Yeah, I hope they do, and that's something at least we can be positive about. So hopefully they do. Vinny, thanks so much for taking time out to speak to us this evening. There you go, it's Vinny Perth and uh, lots more to come on OTBM tomorrow morning as it relates to All-Ireland final build-up with Lee Keegan, no less, Andy McEntee and Barry John Keane all on the show. Tomorrow night here between 7 and 10, Enda McGinley and Colin Boyle will help preview the clash of Kerry and Galway and we'll get Brian O'Driscoll's take on Ireland's series win in New Zealand. Thank you to listen for listening tonight. Thank you to everybody who helped put the show together as well tonight. Tom Dunn is on the way after these. We'll talk.